Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, and welcome to, to RTDology. Sorry, I forgot where I was for a minute. Uh, Burns Engineering's online training series. I'm Jeff Wigan, National Sales Manager at Burns Engineering, and presenting today will be Bill Burquist, our Principal Application Engineer. Today's presentation, Troubleshooting RTDs and Thermocouples, is part of our series of web-based training modules designed to help you better understand temperature and achieve your measurement goals. If you joined us for any of our previous sessions, we'd like to welcome you back. If this is your first time with us, welcome. And when you get a chance, do go ahead and check out our previous presentations on our RTDology channel on YouTube. All you need to do is uh, go to YouTube and search for RTDology, and it will pop up the channel for you. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. To respect everyone's time, we'll make every effort to limit the presentation and Q&A period to one hour. We highly encourage questions, so please type them into the Q&A or the chat box section on your screen and send them to host and presenter. We'll attempt to answer as many as time allows. This session is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube just as soon as it's available, so don't worry if you miss something, you'll be able to catch it there. If we don't get to your question or you need some additional assistance, there will be contact information provided at the end of the presentation. And finally, our goal is to answer your temperature measurement questions and challenges. We put together this RTDology series with an eye to the most commonly asked questions and issues, but if you have a particular topic you'd like to have considered, please do give us a call or shoot us an email and we'll see what we can put together for you. So that kind of covers the housekeeping. So without further delay, here is Bill Berquist to provide some background and assistance with troubleshooting RTDs and thermocouples. Well, hello everyone. Um, I get, I'm assuming today everybody's uh, tuned in here to because uh, they've had previous problems with RTDs or thermocouples and trying to figure out why they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, I'm going to touch on a few of the different, uh, kind of the most common troubleshooting problems that, that I've heard about over the years. Uh, but first I want to go through and look at the construction of an RTD, kind of how it's put together, so that will help, um, I think, with uh, some of the explanation of, of why some of the problems that uh, you may have run across, uh, why they occur. Um, and then if anybody has a um, specific troubleshooting question, um, please throw it in the Q&A or the chat box and let us know about it and we'll try and um, answer that one as we're going through all this stuff. So first off, the uh, RTD, resistance temperature detector construction. Uh, this is what we call a wire wound sensor. It's one of the more common styles. And what what this is is a uh, ceramic tube, and we make these little coils of platinum wire and thread that inside the tube, attach some external lead wires. Uh, this, the internal wires are seven ten thousandths diameter, so as you can imagine, they're fairly fragile. Uh, they have to be supported somewhat so that during shock vibration type stuff, they're they're not really moving around too much. Uh, but if they're tied down too much, that can actually put some extra strain in that wire and cause a resistance shift. So it's kind of a fine balance between durability and um, performance of that sensing element. And then the external lead wires, these are also platinum. Uh, some sensors are made with pure platinum wires. Others have a uh, like a platinum rhodium alloy to make them a little bit stronger, and and that can be another location, um, you know, for a uh, shift in resistance or an open circuit. The other common type of platinum sensor is thin film, and looking at this photograph, um, you can kind of see. Uh, this little ceramic substrate, and then the, you can just barely see these little kind of gray tracings on here. That's the actual platinum that was deposited on that substrate. And then the external lead wires are connected to that little platinum tracing, and then it's covered with a glass material to uh, secure the lead wires to it. And this kind of a sensor 
can be extremely durable. Um, as you can see, the, the platinum can't really move around a whole lot on that, on that substrate. And the glass um, holds the lead wires very securely um, to that substrate and the platinum tracing. And these can be really small. Um, and sometimes they're so small that the lead wires end up being kind of the weak spot in this kind of a sensor. But if they're packaged correctly, they can be, the whole um, assembly then can be extremely durable. And there's a lot of different sizes. This one happens to have these dimensions here. There's some that are probably maybe a third this size. They'll just be maybe cut down to about, about here with the lead wires coming off of it. And then there's some that are even a little bit larger than this. So. And then when we package that, either one of these sensors, um, it, it's typically put inside of a uh, stainless steel tube. Um, right over here, this is one style where there's uh, some internal lead wires that are placed inside of this compressed um, ceramic powder. The lead wires are usually oh, like some kind of a nickel alloy, so they're very durable. Um, and this kind of a lead wire setup can withstand a lot of vibration, a lot of shock, and it also makes the probe um, bendable. So you can put a little bend in it, and the ceramic insulation around here protects those internal wires from shorting against each other when the probe is bent. Then transitioning from um, either these lead wires or in the case of what we call a tube and wire construction, where it's just a tube with some wires running down to that sensing element, they have to exit the probe. And a typical way to do that is just to uh, run it out through an epoxy seal, which works fairly well for um, preventing um, water vapor from getting inside the probe. Um, and any other contaminants. And it also provides some strain relief on those lead wires. One of the big failure modes for RTDs is to have moisture getting inside the probe. And that can cause a low resistance. And we'll get into a little more detail on that just a little bit later here. Um, the other important point here is that the external leads um, or, or the lead wires that might be running down to that sensor in, a, in the tube and wire construction, uh, they're typically copper, but they need to have either a nickel or a silver plating to protect that copper from uh, corrosion due to the higher temperatures that it's going to see. The copper itself will handle just maybe a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit, and if you get much over that, it's going to start to corrode pretty quickly and cause trouble. So these internal leads will have um, some sort of plating on them. Typically, it's nickel. That seems to be the most uh, durable. Silver works OK, too, but again, that can uh, start to tarnish and corrode and, and potentially cause trouble down the road. And when we get outside of the probe, these lead wires have a specific color code, and it helps to identify a couple of things about the probe. The most obvious being that if it's a two, three, or a four wire circuit. Um, the other thing, the color codes can help identify the temperature coefficient, uh, which is defined by either one of these two standards, the ASTM or the IEC. Um, standards for RTDs, and they, they define a temperature coefficient of 0 0.00385. So if you have a, a sensor and it has these, uh, you know, red and white leads, um, you know, specifically the two red leads and the one white, you can be assured that that's a good indication that that is uh, a 0 0.00385 temperature coefficient. One of the little anomalies that uh, we'll see here, the standards call for yellow lead wires in the case of a dual sensing element. Um, you'll see several manufacturers using green. 
And that is just a something that started way before either one of those standards were around and it just hasn't been changed yet. So with that, I don't know if we've got any uh, questions yet on RTD construction or anything or uh, does it doesn't look like uh, uh, we've got any questions okay. yet, but as a as a reminder, if you do have uh, questions as, as Bill goes through the presentation, do go ahead and type them into the chat area or the Q and A section, and we'll go ahead and and try to get them answered as we go. Because if if you've got a question, the likelihood is somebody else has that same question. So uh, go ahead, feel free to ask it, and we'll get you an answer. All right. Well, let's move on here then. Um, so I put together some, just kind of some common things that, that people run across with these things. Um, one of the first ones is just, uh, you know, the sensor's given me this really erratic output. The temperature jumps up and down. Um, you know, sometimes it might even read okay, and then in the temperature will go up. And that's typically an indication that the that sensing element has been damaged. So if you can imagine those, that little coil of platinum wire again. Um, you know, let's say it's been vibrating past what it's capable of surviving and that wire starts to fracture just a little bit. Well, that's going to start changing the resistance and it's going to cause that indicated temperature to start jumping around. And as that fracture vibrates, that resistance can change quite a bit and then eventually it could actually go open circuit. The only solution to that, of course, is just to replace the probe um, and maybe look at one that might be a little more durable or perhaps even reposition the sensor to a different location where it's farther away from um, shock or vibration. One of the common places for uh, mechanical shock to happen and damage a sensor might be in a, a pipeline that has a, uh, a steam injector right just upstream of the temperature probe. And when that steam gets sh shoots into the pipe to heat up the product, that can cause a little bit of a water hammer, and that's going to destroy an RTD in a very short amount of time. Those little platinum wires and lead wires and things just can't survive that much abuse. The other thing that will cause the output to jump around is radio frequency or electromagnetic interference. And this might be coming from electric motors, um, maybe some communications equipment that might be in the building close by, um, or even other uh, lead wires that are, or uh, power wires that are run next to the temperature sensor wires. Um, the other thing is just no signal. Of course, the element being damaged would certainly give you that. Um, and then being wired incorrectly. Um, you know, there are two, three, and four wire circuits for RTDs. And the, the two wire system, of course, um, kind of makes uh, it, it's easy to understand. You just have a resistor and a wire coming off of each side of it. So. But when you use those, that, that's going to put some additional resistance because of those lead wires into that measurement system. The three and four wire systems are there to eliminate that lead resistance from the little platinum sensor resistance. And those have to be connected correctly to the signal conditioning equipment to get an accurate um, temperature indication. And I had one, um, well, this, uh, I'd, I'd mentioned insulation resistance or moisture getting inside the probe. Uh, this is another um, common failure mode. And what this will look like is over, over time you may see uh, that the temperature measurement started out and it's been correct and everything's working right. And then it'll slowly creep down. Um, you know, for no particular reason, you're, you you seem you think your system is still running correctly, but that temperature has just kind of dropped a little bit. And this will be an indication that moisture has gotten inside the probe. 
And what that does is it acts as a shunt between the little coils of the platinum wire or between the actual lead wires on that sensing element. It causes the resistance to drop because the electricity then is taking a shorter path through that sensor because um, it, it's what electricity does. It likes to take the path of least resistance. So uh, when we build these probes, we have to make sure that we're forcing that electricity to go through that platinum sensor and not take a shortcut. And, and moisture is one of the more common shortcuts that it can take and, and cause a, uh, a low temperature indication. Now, how do you fix that? Um, the, the probe can be dried out. You can take it out, put it in an oven. Um, vacuum ovens work a little faster than just a regular oven. Um, you know, just a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit and, you know, maybe a day or two and it'll dry out. But you do have to ask yourself, well, how did the moisture get in there in the first place? You know, and maybe that epoxy seal has been compromised. Um, so it's kind of a, um, you know, a toss up whether you try and dry the probe out and, you know, monitor that insulation resistance going forward just to see how it, what it's doing, or if you just replace the probe. Now, insulation resistance, this, um, again, I'm gonna use the same diagram, but as you can see, again, here, getting moisture down inside of here, it's very easy to uh, cause shunting between these little coils and cause a, a resistance shift. Um, when, when we're, when these parts are built, they're, they're made so that it'll have a insulation resistance of like 500 meg ohms between the probe sheath and the sensing element lead wires. Um, and then because of the characteristics of all the insulation materials, as you go up to the maximum temperature of the probe, that insulation resistance will drop to maybe 10 or 20 meg ohms, which is still enough to um, kind of force the electricity to take the path that we want it to. And, and, that, and that's why we have such a high rating at um, room temperature. Um, if the probe is going to be used at, you know, lower temperatures, um, you know, 10 meg ohms usually is enough to ensure that you get a good accurate measurement. Um, but it does, it's, it is a bit of an indication that something may have gone wrong with it or is going wrong with it just because the probes are made with such a much higher level at room temperature. So anyway, but when we're um, calibrating a sensor, just doing a simple ice bath check, that's one of the first things that gets done is this insulation resistance check. Um, besides showing a lower than actual temperature, the probe can sometimes not repeat that measurement very well because the moisture can move around inside and it might be shorting out, you know, half a dozen of those coils and it might only be shorting out a couple of them. And it tends to move around, especially if the temperature is changing in your process. And so you can actually see the measurement jump around a little bit because of that. It, it, it would be a real slow change, but you'd still might see it going up and down a little bit. Now the way that we do this, like I said, we just put uh, one uh, probe lead to the, to the sheath and the other one to the lead wires and check that resistance. Um, kind of a, a minimum test would be 50 volts DC and it should be over 100 meg ohms at room temp. A lot of specs that you'll see will say 500 volts, 500 meg ohms. And on laboratory probes, it'll be 1,000 meg ohms. Uh, some are even higher than that. They'll get up into the tera ohm range. And for those of you that like a little math with your insulation resistance, you can go through and calculate what it might be for whatever various uh, condition. 
Um, the example here just shows this uh, 0.1 mega ohms, and it's uh, it's going to read a, just a little over a quarter of a degree C lower than actual temperature. Hey Bill, before you go on to the next section, we do have uh, one question. I think it probably goes back to when you were talking about the uh, the size of the uh, the elements. Uh, but the question is: Is there a minimum length of construction for an RTD? Um, you know that that only comes into play for. Um, a sufficient immersion length to get a good accurate temperature measurement. And I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit later. I've got some graphs and some other examples of what a minimum immersion length is required to to maintain an accurate measurement. Um, and I think, um, I, I guess I'm assuming that we're, we're looking at a finished probe here and not just like a sensing element. but. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later here and get into a lot more detail. But yes, there is a, uh, we do have minimum lengths that we recommend for the various types of temperature probes. And it all has to do with stem conduction. Perfect. So um, one of the other things would be um, a slow time response. Um, we've had some some uh, questions over the years about, you know, I, I installed this new probe and it was working fine, and then after a while it seemed to not respond as quickly as it used to. Um, and that can usually be traced back to um, the, the probe going over temperature at, at some point in its life, causing the properties of the potting material to change uh, this would be typical of like if you had potted a sensor in silicone rubber and you overheat that, the, the rubber gets real hard and it ends up being a bit of a thermal insulator. Uh, it, I mean, it's not a very good conductor of heat in the, to begin with, but that makes it worse and it, it actually just gets kind of really hard and brittle. And that'll cause the time response to change. And again, the only way to fix that is just to replace the probe. Uh, you may want to look at a different style that doesn't that uses a different kind of potting material, um, maybe some sort of a ceramic powder, so that if it does exceed its uh, you know service temperature for the silicones or some of the other lower temp materials, um, it, you won't have that same failure mode. Um, the other thing, uh, transmitters, especially the new programmable types, uh, a lot of them have a setting in there for a, a measurement delay. The default is one second from the several that I've looked at. Uh, you can set it up to 60 seconds, uh, maybe even a two or three minutes or whatever. Um, some of the wireless ones have some more, uh, even longer range uh, settings where it'll just delay taking a reading from the temperature probe. So that, that can that can cause a problem. Um, another symptom, um, temperature increases after a short time in service. This is typical of some sort of mechanical abuse to the sensor. It could be vibration, could be shock, it could be really rapid temperature cycling, um, and it just puts a lot of strain on the, the platinum wires. They work harden, the resistance increases, your indicated temperature increases along with that. And but the only couple fixes to that, of course, is to move the probe away from the vibration. Um, you can also um, beef up the probe, might be a larger diameter stem, larger thermal well. Um, and if a, uh, you know, there's a couple different types of RTD probes, some are a little more heavy duty construction than others. Like I mentioned, the um, 
thin film sensors can handle more vibration and shock than the wire wound can. So that that might be something to try. Um, the other, if, if, if none of that works, then a thermocouple is going to be probably your best um, option for a real high vibration or high shock type uh, location. Now, checking an RTD, um, and, and this this is, I, I think, I, you know, a lot of our customers I know will do a, a, a periodic check of the sensors just to make sure that they're um, working correctly. And if you do have a, a place where there is a lot of vibration or shock, it's a good idea to uh, just do a quick ice bath check. And 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 doing it at zero degrees C, it, it's it's the easiest place to check, and it's a very accurate measurement to make. Um, we just use an insulated container, um, make some ice out of you know distilled water, readily available, um, and then you want to pack it inside of the container, and then pour in just enough distilled water to kind of fill up the gaps in between the ice. You don't you don't want the ice to float and you can see here you don't want to even see any water on top of the ice. You just kind of want it to fill in the gaps uh, just kind of up to almost the, the top level. And then when you put the probes in, you know, don't use the probe to bash a hole into the ice because that could actually make the uh, sensing element shift. Um, you know, just use another, uh, you know, a uh, rod of some kind to kind of poke a little hole in there and then pack the ice around the probe. And then read it with a, uh, uh, just an ohm meter. It can be just a little, uh, you know, a little fluke or other two wire meter. Um, some of the more high end meters have a uh, three or a four wire input that does the lead wire compensation. But you can do it manually too. So if you have a um, a sensor with either three or four wires on it, we can just use like the two of the red leads and one of the whites to make this lead wire compensation. So if you measure the resistance of the two red leads and then subtract that from what you measure between one of the red leads and one of the white leads, that'll give you just the resistance of the sensing element. And that should be within the original manufacturer specifications. Uh, most common, of course, are those two ASTM and the IEC standards. And if we look at this graph, we can see um, there's a little bit of difference between the two. But right at zero degrees C, they're going to be the same. And the numbers associated with that, uh, especially the, the IEC standards, probably the most common. So right at uh, zero degrees C for a what they call a class A, um, it'd be plus or minus 0 0.15 degrees C, and the class B is 0 0.3, and then this newer class C is 0 0.6. Now, um, <clears throat> so this is the interchangeability of the sensor, and this is what the manufacturers, when they put these probes together, this is the target that they're shooting for. They want to be within that tolerance. And so when you're doing your ice bath check, um, you want to make sure that they repeat within these numbers. And now if you want to test it at a different temperature, you can use the rest of this equation to calculate what that interchangeability should be. Because as you go away from zero degrees C, as we saw in that graph, the tolerance band increases and these equations will um, allow you to calculate that number for any temperature that you might be checking the sensor at. Difficulty tuning a measurement loop. So we've got our sensor hooked up, we've got maybe a transmitter in the loop and the process is running. Um, and you're, you're trying to get, uh, you know, this, this uh, you know, your, your heat source is, keeps 
coming on and off and on and off and the temperature is going up and down and it never really seems to stabilize. And that's going to be an indication that the time response of the sensor is not keeping up with what your process is doing or it might actually be responding too quickly. So um, we can set a delay in a transmitter. If you do have a transmitter in the loop, uh, you can, there are other construction designs for sensors that can make them faster or slower than the standard offerings. Uh, a good example is in a freezer application where uh, people are going in and out of a freezer, you know, loading product in or taking it out, and you got this blast of warm air coming in. You know, you don't want the sensor to respond to that because it's going to maybe set off an alarm or start up the refrigeration unnecessarily. Um, and just adding some sort of a, an insulating material around the probe, uh, you know, like a, a Teflon shrink tubing is a real quick and easy way to do that in a freezer application. Um, there are some other things that use a little bottle filled with, uh, you know, like propylene glycol, um, which helps act as a kind of a thermal capacitor just so it uh, slows down the response time of the probe. Other areas, and, and this gets back to the question we had about the length of an RTD. Um, you know, you, you, you have a, you've noticed a temperature error in your process. You take the probe out, we check it in an ice bath. It just, it's perfect. It uh, shows no problems. The insulation resistance is fine. Uh, but you stick it back into the service and it's either reading too high or too low. And this is a real, indication of stem conduction. And what's happening is that while it's in the process, the ambient conditions are affecting the temperature that the sensor is seeing. And you'll get uh, um, conduction along the, the lead wires and the probe sheath or the thermal well. Um, and in a case where the process is higher than ambient, um, it's going to have a little bit of a cooling effect on that sensor, so you're going to read too low. Uh, a freezing um, process is going to be the exact opposite. So uh, some ways to resolve this would be, you know, try a different style probe that can get you more immersion length. Uh, if it's possible to put insulation around the sensor and the, the piping on either side of it, that can be a real easy way to fix it. Um, and if you have a thermal well in, involved in that measurement, you want to make sure that the probe is long enough to touch the bottom of the well and that it's spring-loaded and firmly held uh, in that well. We can also put some uh, heat transfer paste right at the very tip of the well, just so that it covers probably about the bottom inch right where that sensing element is resides. Um, and then the last thing where I've seen some significant errors is if you have a probe that doesn't match the bore diameter of the thermal well very closely. So if you had a, a thermal well in that had like a, you know, it was a bore for a 3 8 diameter probe rather than a quarter inch, and you stick a quarter inch probe in there, that leaves a lot of air space, um, and that's just going to make the stem conduction problem worse. And, and in that case, uh, you know, you can either, we can put a, an enlarged tip on the probe to take up that space um, or replace the thermal well. Uh, those would be two of the more, the easiest solutions to that kind of a problem. So looking at uh, the magnitude of stem conduction, this graph shows um, an estimate of the error on the y-axis here and the immersion length down here. So this would be just a regular kind of a tapered stem thermal well with a quarter inch diameter probe inside of it. Um, you know, the bore diameter and the probe are matched up um, 
typically uh, about a ten thousandth of an inch difference between the probe diameter and the bore diameter. And you need to get out here, you know, this is first line here is a tenth of a degree C error. So we're right at four inches as a minimum immersion to get a good measurement. Um, the graph here was constructed with using water as the fluid. Um, different fluids, you're going to have different results here. Uh, but this is just kind of a, just kind of get into the ballpark of, of what is um, acceptable. And this was also done with a 100 degrees C temperature difference between the process and the ambient conditions. So if your process and your ambient temperatures are the same, of course, you're not going to have any stem conduction error. But the farther they get apart, the magnitude of that error increases. Now, if we go with a direct immersion probe, you can see that line shifted off to the left here. A little shorter immersion, we still get a good um, accurate measurement. Now we're down to about three and a half inches. Um, and if we were to go with a uh, smaller diameter probe, um, you can get by with even less immersion length to overcome that stem conduction. And as we can see there with the eighth inch, um, you know, now we're down, down to almost two inches of immersion to, to maintain a good accurate measurement. So some other sources of trouble for RTDs. Say, uh, Bill, before yeah. before we go on, we got a couple questions here. I think uh, before we get uh, too far, I'd just like to uh, uh, see if we can't get an get an answer for these folks. So, one of them is uh, they've got a situation where they've done the uh, triple point uh, twice, and the results they're getting is um, it looks to be minus uh, point zero 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 eight nine five seven, and then the second time it's uh, minus point zero zero nine nine three nine. And so they're uh, wondering, does that mean that there is moisture in the probe? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming that this is a, uh, a laboratory standard. Um, and usually out at that fourth decimal place, uh, you, you know, you're you're into the uncertainty um, of your measurement equipment. And with that little bit of a change, I'd say no, moisture is probably not the issue. I think it's more of a, a repeatability and um, normal um, uncertainty of the equipment that's used to measure that small of a resistance. Okay, and then another question is, uh, do RTDs have a temperature cycle lifespan? So, in other words, if there were, um, you know, many large temperature swings per day, uh, will this eventually lead to uh, failure of the RTD? Yeah, what you'll see with RTDs, especially the industrial styles, they, they will show um, some drift, and it's going to happen... Like if you were to cycle the thing, um, I, I think it's fairly common to have like the uh, manufacturers say they'll cycle it ten times from, you know, over its uh, temperature capability or from zero up to its maximum temperature, and it'll be, you know, they'll have like a point zero something percent of resistance as a shift. Um, in the initial, you're, you're, you're going to see more drift initially with temperature cycling than you are as, as you continue with those temperature, more and more temperature cycles. Uh, you know, and eventually it may go out of the um, interchangeability tolerances that we looked at earlier. So in that regard, I would say yes, that... Um, Frequent temperature cycling will shorten the life of the probe. Um, I've run across some probes that have been in service at one temperature for 30 years, and they still check out within their original interchangeability. 
Um, but that's just because there's there's no vibration. It's just a steady temperature, um, and they, they have no reason to, to shift at that point. So, yeah, temperature cycling uh, definitely can shorten the lifespan. It, and, Bill, what would you characterize as a, as a question said, a large temperature swing? So what would you kind of uh, indicate as a large uh, temperature swing versus uh, a smaller well, for a like a thin film sensor, I'd say a couple hundred degrees C, and for the wire wands, um, probably add another hundred C to that, where um, you're going to start seeing some significant uh, drifting going on. Um, the the wire wand sensors seem to be a little more resistant to uh, temperature cycling. You know, and the other thing to look at too is if you know, if you take a probe and, um, you know, stick it in liquid nitrogen and then go to 500C within, you know, a couple seconds, uh, that's probably going to wreck it pretty quickly. I mean, you're going to see some really bad things happen. Um, but shortening that down, like a wire wand going from zero to, you know, a couple hundred degrees C really, um, you're not, you're not going to see much change with that. Thin film, though, you're going to see a little bit more. They're not quite as resistant to it. All right, great. Thanks, Bill. That's it? Okay. Well, let's move on then. Um, the uh, Some of the other things that I've run across that, that cause trouble with these sensors is um, just corrosion on connections. Um, especially in a three-wire RTD system, the lead wire compensation depends on all three of those um, circuit paths to have exactly the same resistance and of course uh, the real world that just doesn't happen you know you get a corroded terminal there's also some variation in just the, the lead wire itself uh, you may have a connector in that circuit um, that gets you know cycled numerous times and it the, the you get a little different contact resistance between each of the, the three pins in your connector um, and, and those can cause some significant uh, temperature measurement errors. Um, terminal blocks inside of a connection head can be a problem. Uh, we had we had um, um, you know if anything can get inside that connection head, it can cause trouble. Uh, a four wire circuit, on the other hand, really is the best for RTDs because that compensates for a lot of bad maintenance. You know, if you have a corroded terminal, it still compensates fully for the lead resistance and that extra resistance in that corroded terminal or a bad connector. Um, so it's a real huge um, benefit of using a four-wire system. In fact, I've got a photo here of this connection head. Like this uh, terminal block looks just fine. Um, and you know the connection has shown a little bit of dirt. Something something got in there. And what this was, it had a piece of flexible um, armor connected to it that was it was just kind of the spiral wrap stuff that has you know it doesn't seal air. So and there was this electrically conductive powder that was around and eventually got inside that conduit, made its way inside the head covered part of the terminal block, although you can't really even see it, but it was causing some shunting between the lead wires that were hooked up inside there and causing uh, a, a low temperature reading. Uh, so that one took a little while to uh, figure out until we got the part back and looked at it and said, oh, it, this is it. So uh, sometimes you can't even imagine what, what can happen with this, but uh, in this case it was just some something got inside the head and caused a problem. Um, frayed lead wires, you know, all these are going to have a little different, uh, you know, contact resistance, especially if you wrap it around a screw terminal and tighten it down. It's just not a good thing. So uh, going with tinned leads or even putting some spade lugs on them or even pin ferrules, that's another really good way to handle it. That They just slip over the leads and increase the diameter of it a little bit to make it a little more durable. Um, High quality connectors with gold plated pins, 
uh, very firm locking together. And then, of course, uh, terminal blocks that not only are they, uh, you know, capable of the temperature, but they're not going to um, absorb moisture. Um, so ceramic makes a real good uh, material for terminal blocks. So with that, I think uh, if we don't have any more questions, we could just jump right into thermocouples. Yep, yep, I think you're good. Okay. Well, it looks like I'm going to have to talk fast because we're kind of running short on time here. So anyway, um, the uh, construction of thermocouples here, you know, it's a pretty simple little device. I'm sure a lot of you are probably already familiar with this, but it's uh, just uh, two wires with the junction welded together. And when you run this through a temperature gradient, um, there's a voltage that can be measured. And when that voltage, when the temperature changes, the voltage changes. So that's a real basic, simple way to look at how they work. Um, they can handle a lot of vibration, as you can imagine, just by looking at it. A lot of shock, um, pretty hard to break them. Um, and they can be done with the same mineral insulated cable. And in this case, instead of like nickel wires that would be used for an RTD, these would be the actual thermocouple grade lead wires. <clears throat> and they'll use the same epoxy seal for the external leads, uh, fiberglass, Teflon, lots of different types of insulation. These can also be built with the tube and wire type uh, sensors and then they can also be used with this junction exposed um, to the process. It might be a case where you're trying to just measure air temperature in a room and you need a real fast time response and that'd be a good way to do it with an exposed junction thermocouple. Um, with the types that have the sheath around them we can have that uh, junction either grounded into the the probe sheath, or it can be isolated, as shown in this one. And a couple of reasons why you might want to do that, uh, either one of these. The, the grounded version, uh, you'll get a little faster time response. Uh, the insulated or isolated version or ungrounded version uh, is a little less susceptible to electrical interference. Uh, you may have, a, you know, might be blowing a powder through a pipeline and there's some static charge built up, well, that could help isolate it and uh, isolate the thermocouple from that static charge and um, avoid having an erratic or reading that would jump around. Um, again, our, uh, we talked about RFI and EMI. Thermocouples are even more susceptible to this. Um, we're only looking at measuring a millivolt uh, signal coming from that thermocouple. And it doesn't take a whole lot of either of those to cause it to be very erratic or cause just a, a step change in temperature. Some ways around this are use a good shielded cable that's uh, grounded at the at the uh, signal conditioner end. You know, leave the shield open at the temperature probe end, and that way it can drain that noise away. Uh, another solution is to just put a transmitter at the temperature measurement location and, and run a, uh, you know, just your uh, current or voltage uh, uh, signal back to your control system. Uh, those are a lot more resistant to RFI or EMI interference. One of the drawbacks to thermocouples is that they do drift fairly quickly, uh, especially at the higher temperatures. Lower temperatures, not so much, but if you're running, you know, 1,000 degrees, 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, they can drift pretty quickly. So, you know, you may want to put that on a, you know, replacement schedule every six months or a year. Um, that there's really no fix to it or anything. It's just the normal. Um, kind of degrading of the thermocouple wire. It can pick up contaminants, um, 
and especially at the higher temperatures, you, you, it it uh, can become contaminated pretty easily. Thermocouple has a very short life. Uh, sometimes there's corrosion that can happen within the sheath. And I've got some photographs on a couple of slides from here I think that we'll take a look at too. Um, but if that is an issue, there are some different thermocouple types that can be used, um, like a type K that we'll look at. Um, if, if you're getting a short life from that, there's a type N that can help uh, extend that life, um, you know, maybe another 20% or so. No signal, uh, that hot junction that we looked at uh, could be broken, you may have your wires hooked up backwards. Um, you can check the polarity. On, on thermocouples, there there's, are color codes associated with them. And on all the, the base model or the base uh, metal type thermocouples, the negative lead is always red. So if we look at these, um, you know, and this, this one here, this is a fairly common Teflon insulated wire. And you really can't even see that there's a purple stripe on one of those wires and that would be um, the positive lead and the other one would just be the negative. But on some of the other types like this would be a type T where you've got the red lead. Of course, the blue is, is the, uh, indicates that it's a type T, type K. The, the positive is yellow. Now the the uh, high temperature ones like a type R, S, and B thermocouples, you'll sometimes see these lead wires. Um, they may show that they're black, um, but what this manufacturer did was um, just put a little plus on the ceramic here so we can assume that this lead is the plus and the other one's the minus. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any real hard and fast rules that manufacturers follow for the high temp um, type R, S, and B thermocouples. So this is an example of corrosion that can happen in a type K thermocouple. And you can see all this kind of this green stuff and it's just, it's selective oxidation of the, uh, the chromel wire in the, in the thing, in the, uh, inside the probe. And it's it's caused by um, you know oxygens in there and, and it will corrode it. So some ways to get around that would be to switch to a different type, like maybe a type N. Um, you can also increase the um, available oxygen level, which could help. Um, and, it, and the other thing that you probably probably better off doing is just to replace it on a more frequent basis so you can avoid this kind of thing. Some of the symptoms of that, you'll notice that uh, on a type K, neither one of the lead wires are real magnetic, but uh, if this is happening, you'll notice that one of the wires is going to become uh, much more magnetic than it normally would be. Um, so it's kind of an interesting failure mode actually, but um, it, it does happen and you just need to be aware that um, uh, probably the easiest solution is just to go ahead and just replace it. They're, you know, thermocouples are pretty inexpensive, usually, you know, $30, $50 or so for uh, one that's uh, spring loaded, goes in a thermal well type thing. So that's probably the easiest way to handle that. Um, some other issues with thermocouples would be making sure that your instrumentation is set to the correct type thermocouple. You know, there's the, the base metal thermocouples, the most common types, there's a J, K, T, and E. So you need to make sure the settings are correct either in the transmitter or in your um, signal conditioning equipment uh, to accept that type thermocouple. Each one of those has a different temperature millivolt relationship. And that's why that's important to make sure you have the right um, relationship set up in your instrumentation. 
Say, so Bill, can you just, uh, some people have uh, some questions about uh, thermocouples and reference uh, junctions. So can you just talk a little bit about uh, uh, junctions and how that works so they can better understand the issues that might come to put, come into play? Sure. Um, with, with the, uh, you know, the, the with a thermocouple, you need to have some kind of a, a reference junction. Um, you, you'll hear, hear it referred to as a cold junction. Uh, this is usually built into the electronics, and it just um, it, it's it's the it's the base so that you that um, so that a voltage can be measured. So you you need to have that um, that reference junction, and you know if you heat up the thermocouple. Um, the electronics use that so that it knows what that difference is, and you get the voltage measured that way. And like I said, it, it's in all the equipment that's used for, you know, like the transmitters and control equipment, whatever, that cold junction is, or I shouldn't even call it a cold junction, just a reference junction is already built into that device. They'll have another little temp sensor in there or something that'll, that, that, um, acts as that reference. So maybe you can talk a little bit about, um, I guess, inadvertent uh, reference junctions or inadvertent cold junctions, because oh, you know, that's a that's, big issue with thermocouples. Sure, you know, that, that's a good point, too. I think, um, yeah, and I think I was going to mention that here at some point. Maybe I forgot already. But um, um, if you have a... Um, Oh, you know, thermocouple installed, and you get the extension wire run over to somewhere, and for whatever reason, that extension wire gets damaged, and those leads short together, or if you get, um, you know, some kind of conductive whatever on them, and it causes some um, connection between the two, that can actually form another junction, and what you'll end up doing is be reading an average temperature between the hot junction that's in your process and that accidental junction. Um, and it'll just be an average between the two. So it could be, uh, you know, depending on the, what the process is doing, it could be an average that's higher or lower than what you're expecting. Um, and it doesn't, uh, it's probably more common to happen, like in the case of maybe a fiberglass insulated lead where moisture can get inside there and, and act as a conductor between those two anywhere along that run of lead wire. Um, so yeah, that's, um, I, I guess that is it. That yep, the question? I think that, okay. that was, that was I, I think, the question and, and just one of those things to pay attention to with with thermocouples because you 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 know the the ju the hot junction or, or you know essentially the tip of the of the sensor and then the and then the reference junction anything that happens in between those two uh, is is going to impact your uh, your reading so that's something that you want to want to take a look at and um, you know maybe you you'll probably go over it here in a little bit uh, uh, Bill but the the question just came up so perfect. Okay. Yeah, actually, this this is what I was thinking. I did put it in here. <laughs> but anyway, the other thing I want I can mention here too is that with the extension wires, um, you know, you can't just use regular copper wire to hook up a uh, thermocouple. You need to use either thermocouple grade wires that match the same material as the actual thermocouple or the extension wires, which is a little lower grade stuff. It's kind of less expensive. Um, works okay as an extension uh, from the thermocouple. Um, so that that's important to do, um, and then of course our uh, explanation we just had about uh, creating another measurement junction. Um, and with that, um, it's the last thing again, RFI EMI, uh, really important for thermocouples. Use a shielded cable. Um, I don't know if there's ever a case where using an unshielded cable is, is even really acceptable. It, it, they're they're just so susceptible to these kinds of issues. Um, time response, I guess we talked about this earlier. Same goes for thermocouples. Um, they do respond faster than RTDs, but um, uh, you know they, they, 
there are ways to build these that either have a faster or slower response time. So and with that, I think uh, if we have any other questions, we can certainly handle those now. Um, and if you have something else, feel free to just, you know, shoot me an email, give me a call, whatever. Um, be glad to uh, answer any more questions. Um, we also have a, an info at Burns Engineering address. You can send it off to that. And then there's uh, a couple other people that uh, monitor that email and uh, can get you an answer also. Yeah, so uh, certainly if you do have a, have a quick question, uh, you want to go ahead and ask it now. We are, we are up with our time, but for anybody who wants to hang on, uh, you know, if you've got another question, you want to type it in, great. Otherwise, you can send it to us, uh, send it to us later uh, at the information that was just up on, uh, or the addresses that were just up on the screen, and we'll go ahead and get you an answer. And as always, um, you know, we... You don't always have to do things by email. If you just want to pick up the phone and give us a call and ask us a question, we, oh, no, we answer the phone as well. So. That, that's too old school. I know, I know. It's, I, I'm, still, I'm still the old school. I, I like to, uh, we do like to talk to people occasionally. So, uh, uh, so feel free to, uh, to give us a call at any point. Uh, sometimes it's just easier to ask a question and go back and forth uh, rather than, oh. than multiple emails. I'll have the, uh, this, today's session up on YouTube here probably later today or tomorrow morning. So if um you know if you, if you want to look at something again for whatever reason it'll it'll be out there. Um Okay. With that, I guess we're all wrapped up. Yep. Then. Yep. So just want to remind people, uh, this is our our, our last session uh, here. We're going to take a little time off for for the summer, and then uh, our next session will be in September. And that was just up on the screen. We certainly hope to see you back for that one. And uh, with that, I uh, hope you have a great day and enjoy your summer. <laughs>